Have you ever thought about using an airplane engine on a Formula One car? And have you ever thought of using the same engine to run the Indy 500 and win it? If the answer is no, well, you're normal people. But if the answer is yes, you are completely insane, you live in the late 60s and you actually did it. You built a car with an airplane engine. This is the incredible story of this car which actually competed in the Indy 500. First of all, we need to understand what do we mean with turbine engine? Well, the answer is quite easy, right? We just mean a turbocharged engine, right? Exactly like nowadays Formula 1's engines. We have the engine and we have the turbo, right? Well, actually, no. Turbocharged engines and turbine are two different things. Because turbo engines are internal combustion engines with pistons to which the turbocharger is added in order to increase the performance. While in the turbine engines, the engine itself is a huge turbine. And let me explain the concept of the turbine. Some of you may already know, some of you may not, but the electricity that you have in your house almost certainly comes from a turbine. Turbines are everywhere in the world. Wind turbines are turbines. The energy you get from a dam comes from water that flows into a turbine. In nuclear power plants, you have turbines. In coal power plants, we have turbines. Aircrafts and helicopters use turbines. Nuclear submarines use turbines. In short, we humans love turbines. But why? The reason is simple, because they are efficient, inexpensive piece of machinery that it's quite easy to design and build. And how do they work, these turbines? In order to understand it, just think about the pinwheel. If you blow into the pinwheel, it starts to spin. And the basic idea of a turbine is exactly the same. A fluid goes through the turbine blades, and that fluid can be water in case of dams, or gas in case of turbochargers, and those blades are designed to generate lift when they are hit by the fluid. And the lift is the same that generates downforce in Formula 1 cars. With the difference that that lift pushes the car to the ground in order to provide grip in the corners, while inside a turbine, it pushes on the blade, allowing the whole turbine to spin. And when the whole turbine starts to spin, with that spinning movement, you can do whatever you want. If you connect it to a generator, you create electricity. And so, if you connect it to a gearbox of a car, what do you get? Motion. This is exactly our idea. We use a turbine to make the wheel spin and therefore the car move. Huh, okay, and where do we get the fluid to make the turbine spin? Well, we can take the outside air. Unfortunately not, it's not enough for us. So the concept goes like this. We have a compressor that takes the outside air and compresses it to tremendous pressures and temperatures. Then that compressed air is thrown into a combustion chamber where we shoot the fuel ready to burn with the air. And the fuel we are using is kerosene. Kerosene? Why not gasoline? Well, kerosene, if you don't know it, is a distilled of petroleum that, to make it simple, it stands between gasoline and diesel. And kerosene is used in the aircrafts basically because it has a better quality than diesel, but it's cheaper than gasoline. And considering that in turbines you burn a lot of fuel, well, we want that fuel not to be too expensive. So, from that combustion chamber, we get exhaust gases that are overflowing with energy because we use massive tons of air and kerosene. So, where do we send those gases? Those gases are not just exhaust gases, but they are the fluid that makes our turbine spin. We send those gases through the turbine, then we connect the transmission of a car, which is connected to the wheels, and there we go, we have the movement. We are ready to put an airplane engine on a race car. So, unlike the classic combustion engines in cars, where the gasoline, by burning, moves a piston up and down that makes a crankshaft rotate and therefore the wheels rotate and the exhaust gases are thrown in the air, unless we use a turbocharger, here we have a combustion chamber without pistons. Where is the exhaust gases that are used to make the turbine spin and the wheel spin? And so, here it is, the Paxton STP turbine. I'm going to use an airplane engine to win the Indy 500. You must be a little crazy to think something like that. And the crazy guy with this idea was Ken Wallace. He was an engineer coming from a family of geniuses engineers who were particularly active during the World War II. And do you see these bouncing bumps? Yeah, that's what they were designing. <laughs> Lucky for us, Ken Wallace unleashed his geniuses not on bombs, but on cars. 
and one day can get into his hands an engine for small planes and helicopters. We're talking about a turbine engine exactly like the one I just explained, capable of producing 600 horsepower at 40,000 RPMs. 40,000! Well, I mean, if you want to fly a helicopter or a plane, that engine must be powerful, right? <laughs> And what do you need to win the Indy 500? You need a lot of power. So, Ken Wallace has the idea. He just needs tons of money and someone crazy enough to believe in this project. He went around the paddock to discuss the project. He even talked to the famous Dan Gurney. But you know what? Nobody believed him. I mean, using an airplane engine inside a race car? Come on! Ken needed to find somebody as crazy as him. Someone with a lot of money and with a huge desire to win the Indy 500. Well, that guy was there. I'm talking about Andy Granatelli, the legendary patron of the STP, a lubricant company famous for its advertisements. STP, you need some STP. What a little can can keep you running free and sober clothes that even Andy enjoyed putting on during the month of May, which was the month of the Indy 500. Granatelli might be a sympathetic figure, but he was dead serious. He was a capable businessman, he was friend with the President of the United States, and most of all, he has racing in his blood. He dreamed of winning the Indy 500 as a driver, and how he's dreaming to win it with his own team. There we go, we just have the deal. The project proceeds at supersonic speeds and the car is finally ready for the 1967 Indy 500. And when that car was racing through Indianapolis, people got crazy. They used to call it the Rouge Mobile from the sound of the turbine spinning at 40,000 RPMs. Or they also called it the Silent Sam or the Shadow. And it was very strange because the turbine was put on the left while the driver was put on the right. It was four-wheel drive, the powerful was crazy, and the torque as well. And it's possibly the beginning of a new breed. Okay, and so at this point we're wondering, why don't nowadays Formula One cars are turbine-powered? Well, because a turbine-powered car is almost impossible to drive. <laughs> yeah, because the little problem is that from the moment you step on the gas to the moment you actually get the power, you have a lag of three seconds. Three seconds. <laughs> but after those three seconds, well, you get a triumph of power. <laughs> the Paxton STP, here is the name of the car, it's literally scaring all the opponents and they are right to be afraid. Because when the Indy 500 starts, the driver, Parnelli Johns, totally dominates the race. Totally unopponed. Parnelli is one step close to win the race for the first time in history with a turbine-powered car. Except, with four laps to go, a few dollars worth part of the transmission breaks. It was a minor break, which came at the last moment, and the victory fades. <sighs> Crazy. But that turbine engine proved to be unbeatable. So, the car is there, it's fast, they will try again next year. Well, unfortunately, that engine was immediately limited by the regulations, to the point that it became impossible to use it as they used. The only way to use it with the new regulations was to modify the chassis. And so, Andy Granatelli needed the most visionary chassis maker in the world. I'm talking about Colin Chapman, the boss of Lotus. And so they tried again! In 1968, Lotus would run the Indy 500 in partnership with STP and use the same turbine engine of our story, adapted to the new restrictions and capable of delivering only 500 horsepower with a torque of 1250 newton meters. Ah. So how was this car? First of all, if you're enjoying this video, let me know because I have hundreds of stories like this one. And if you want to see more, please just subscribe to the channel. It's free, it takes just one click, so I will understand that you like these videos. So the Lotus 56, developed by Colin Chapman and his engineers, was very innovative. The driver returns to the center, with the turbine directly behind him, and the wedge-shaped body was super innovative even more than the Formula 1 cars. And it's no coincidence that the Lotus 72, one of the most important Formula 1 cars in history, took inspiration from that car. The new car is fast, and it proved to be as competitive as the Paxton STP of the previous year. They are ready to win, this time for real. 
But it seems like the fate doesn't want them to win. In fact, during the free practices, the driver Mike Spence lost his life. He was trying to push harder and harder, when at some point he entered turn one too fast, he hit the wall and he got struck in the head by one of the wheels. <sighs> if only the halo would have been invented. So, the day of the 1968 Indy 500 arrives, the day of truth of the remaining Lotus 56. Graham Hill, one of the drivers, is out midway through the race, while Joe Leonard, with only 9 laps to go, broke the fuel pump. And so the race is over. In short, the turbine engine works for Indy. It's fast, it's competitive. They were just unlucky. So you have the car, it's fast, they will try again next year. Well, as always, when you do something too good, in motorsports you end up getting restricted. And so the new rules became so restrictive that the turbine engines became unusable. Unusable from the USA. But what about the Europe? Well, in Formula 1, they were usable. And so, here comes the Lotus 56B. The first and only Formula 1 car in history with a turbine engine. After all, Colin Chapman's reasoning was on point. I mean, we have a car that can win in the 500. Why don't we adapt it to Formula 1? Let's try. And so, they tried it in some races in 1971. The engine was modified a little in order to adapt it to the European circuits, because they were now racing in ovals, and so the drivers needed to modulate the power. Wings were added, and they kept the car four-wheel drive. And then new brakes were designed, and I'm talking about huge brakes. Well, exactly the brakes were the biggest problem of the Lotus 56B. Well, yeah, because actually that car was powerful and well-balanced, but the biggest problem was that it was too heavy and burned too much fuel compared to the other Formula 1 cars. And when a car is heavy, it stresses the brakes too much. But still, there was a huge issue. Do you remember the 3 seconds lag? Well, it was still there. And do you want to know what the drivers were forced to do to prevent the lag? While still braking and entering the corner, the driver had to immediately start to accelerate in order to anticipate the 3 seconds delay. But the problem was that that power used to come all at once. So in order not to spin and not to crash, the driver needed to use the brakes to modulate the acceleration. So if the brakes were already really stressed for the brakings, can you imagine using them also while accelerating? Those brakes were always overheated. Just think about what Emerson Fittipaldi said when talking about the Lotus 56B. It was the worst car I ever drove. <laughs> and the results prove him right. Even the Lotus realized it. Fittipaldi finished P8 in Monza after taking 2.4 seconds from the pole. In Silverstone, they retired. In Zandvoort, they paid 4 seconds in qualifying. But actually, in Zandvoort, they were close to win the race. Yeah, because during the race, it started raining. And suddenly, that four-wheel drive car turned out to be faster than the other cars. But as I said before, that car was undrivable. So when Dave Walker, the driver, was getting close to a victory, he made a mistake and he lost it. I mean, a race car where you have to brake when you want to accelerate. <laughs> what do you expect? So the dream of the turbine-powered Laudus 56B finished after Monza. It was too complicated, too uncompetitive. Actually, it would have been competitive in the ovals, but the regulations made that engine impossible to use. So, in the end, a turbine engine single-seater raced in the Indy and in Formula 1, but never won. Even if it got so close to winning. Still, it was a stroke of genius. A stroke of genius that worked. So, in the end, the answer is yes. An airplane turbine engine can work on a race car. And you can actually win if you're racing in ovals.